Another way of decomposing a matrix is through QR decomposition. And it is very useful in many, many problems, or many scenarios. So um, basically the QR decomposition theorem says that if you're given a matrix A of size M, N by M, so it need not be square, and N greater than or equal to M. So basically it's a matrix that's tall like this. So this is N by M and N greater than or equal to M. Okay. Then um, there exists a Q, which is in C to the N by M, and uh, with orthonormal columns, Um, and R, which is upper triangular of size M by M, such that A equals QR. Okay. And if M equals N, then Q is unitary. Of course, it's orthonormal and it's square, so it must be unitary. And uh, the last part is that if in addition A is non-singular, then R can be chosen such that its diagonal entries are all strictly positive. That means they're real and positive. So keep in mind that you cannot compare a complex number to zero and say that is it greater than zero or less than zero. You cannot order complex numbers. But on the real line, you can order things. So when I say that all its diagonal R can be chosen such that all its diagonal entries are greater than zero, what I really mean is that I can choose R such that all the diagonal entries are real and positive. In this case, Q and R are unique. Okay, so I won't prove this theorem, but it's actually a direct consequence of the Gram-Schmidt uh, ortho ortho orthogonalization process. So essentially all you'll be doing is to run Gram-Schmidt on the columns of A, and uh, you see that the corresponding coefficients that you learn, uh, that, you, that you compute, can be arranged in the form of an upper triangular matrix R. Okay, that's the, I mean, that's how it goes. So I won't write the proof out. But one, one important utility of the skewer decomposition is to calculate eigenvalues. So recall that uh, the, the way to find eigenvalues is to first write out the characteristic polynomial and then you have to find the roots of this nth order polynomial for a general n cross n matrix. And uh, there is no simple procedure to find the roots for n greater than 2. For n equals 2, it's a quadratic form and we know we can write the, the roots of a quadratic enclosed form. But for n greater than 2, we cannot write the roots in closed form. We'll have to use some numerical zero finding algorithm to find those roots. So this is called the this algorithm is called the QR algorithm. And it basically helps uh, is useful for finding the eigenvalues of the matrix. 
<clears throat> keep in mind that the QR decomposition by itself doesn't reveal the eigenvalues of a matrix. In particular, uh, the diagonal entries of R are not the eigenvalues of the matrix A. Okay, uh, but we can use this decomposition to uh, in this uh, in this algorithm to find the eigenvalues of A. So let the matrix A, which I'll call A0, um, in C to the n cross n, it's a square matrix, be given. Then what we do is to first compute a QR decomposition of A. I'll, I'll state that as write A0, Q0, R0. So we've computed the QR decomposition. Uh, sir, the dimension of A0 is n cross n. Yes. Okay. So now it's a square matrix because I'm trying to show you how this QR decomposition could be used to find eigenvalues. And eigenvalues are things we define only for square matrices. Then what we do is we compute this matrix which I'll call A1, which is equal to R0 times Q0. So all I'm doing is I first computed this QR decomposition and then I'm just reversing the order and multiplying it as R0, Q0. Now this A1, I'll compute its QR decomposition. So this is another QR decomposition step. And then I'll compute A2. So I don't know how many times I should write this, but this is the pattern. R1, Q1, and so on. So the kth step will be, we write AK equals QK, RK. And the K plus one step would be to compute AK plus one equals RK, QK. This is again a QR decomposition step. Okay, and now, uh, so this is the algorithm. <coughs> and so one, uh, first, before we proceed, one claim is that AK is unitarily equivalent to A. OK, so that is easy to show. So for example, if A1 equals R0, Q0, then if I consider Q0 times A1, that is going to be Q0, R0, Q0, which is equal to Q0, R0 is A0. And uh, this Q0 has orthonormal columns, so it is unitary. So which means that Q0, A1, Q0 Hermitian equals A0, or A1 is unitarily equivalent to A0, and so on. And so AK is unitarily equivalent to A0. So it gives you a sequence that are all unitarily equivalent. And what one can show, which I'm not going to show again here, this is an algorithm, it's one of its properties, is that under, circun uh, under certain circumstances, so for example, if uh, the eigenvalues of A are all distinct. Um, so under certain conditions, e.g. the eigenvalues of A 
a zero have distinct absolute values um, the qr iterates ak converge to an upper triangular matrix as k tends to infinity. So since this upper triangular matrix is unitarily equivalent to A0, um, the, the diagonal entries are the uh, of, of this AK, as K goes to infinity, are the eigenvalues of A0. So this is one one other numerical recipe that um, uh, that one can use to find the eigenvalues of a matrix A. Okay, so now that we've started discussing factorizations, um, we'll discuss uh, what is what are known as canonical forms. So these are basically um, forms where, I mean, processes by which we reduce a matrix down to a simpler form. So the motivation is that uh, one basic question you can ask is, when are two matrices going to be similar? Okay, we know that similar matrices have the same trace, the same determinant, the same eigenvalues, the same, uh, same characteristic equation. But it is also possible that matrices can be different without uh, can can cannot can be uh, it's possible to find matrices that are not similar to each other but have the same trace determinant eigenvalues and characteristic polynomial so it's uh, it's still not clear how we will verify that two matrices are actually similar to each other okay if you can find a matrix such that s inverse a s equals b then Great, you're lucky. You, you found this matrix and so you know that A and B are similar. But if you don't, if you are not able to find that matrix, how do you prove or otherwise or disprove that two matrices are similar? So, um, uh, um, so one, one possible approach is uh, to, to, find, to determine similarity is to try and reduce both matrices down to some simple form. For example, a diagonal form. And then see if these diagonal forms are similar, are the same, uh, up to possibly permit, uh, permutations of the diagonal entries. And so, uh, so, so, so that is one way to determine similarity. If, if the di if you are able to reduce both matrices down to a diagonal form and check that the two diagonal forms are actually the same, uh, then you know that the two matrices are similar. So these are what we call canonical forms reducing a matrix down to its simplest form, which will then allow us to test for properties like similarity. Um, so basically, um, the, the, uh, so if you could reduce things to diagonal matrices or reduce all these matrices to diagonal matrices, then that would work. Um, but the problem is that not every matrix is diagonalizable. And so we have an existence problem. If two matrices are both non-diagonalizable, then it's difficult to know whether those matrices are similar or not. Now, an alternative could be to try and use uh, Shor's theorem, which will allow you to reduce a matrix to an upper triangular form. Um, and then you can say, let me try to compare these upper triangular forms. But in this upper triangular form that you obtained from Shor's theorem, uh, the diagonal entries can 
potentially appear in any order and uh, two upper triangular matrices uh, with the same even if two upper triangular matrices have the same diagonal entries but different di off diagonal entries then those two matrices can still be similar and so essentially it's uh, sure theorem is insufficient to determine whether or not two matrices are similar now if we search for a, an upper triangular form that is as close to being diagonal as possible but is still attainable for every matrix then that form is called the jordan canonical form and uh, this uh, uh, jordan canonical form is a set of almost diagonal matrices and in fact if the matrix is indeed diagonal then the jordan canonical form will return a di diagonal matrix so in some sense it is a generalization of diagonalizability of matrices so the jordan canonical form is a set of almost diagonal matrices and these matrices are called jordan matrices and uh, these jordan matrices include diagonal matrices and it, and the, the punchline is that every equivalence class under similarity of uh, square complex matrices includes a jordan matrix and any two jordan matrices of the same equivalence class are the same in a very trivial way we will be able to look at the jordan forms and say yes these are the same or these are different so the main result we will we will discuss next is that um, every complex square matrix is similar to an essentially unique by essentially unique unique i mean that these these uh, um, matrices which are called jordan matrices Uh, is is has a block diagonal structure and those blocks are called jordan blocks and those uh, the the only thing that's allowed is a permutation of those blocks but other than that the matrices the jordan blocks will be uh, the jordan matrices will be unique and so this is called the jordan canonical form reduces a matrix to an almost diagonal matrix which is called a jordan matrix okay and um, as i said um the jordan matrices of two matrices in the same equivalence class okay let me write that that's actually an important point so the jordan matrices of a pair of matrices in the same similarity equivalence class are the same in a trivial way meaning that only the 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 block diagonals in the block diagonal structure of the jordan matrix some blocks could be exchanged 
but otherwise they they will be the same so you can uh, it, it's very easy to check whether the jordan matrices are the same or they are different okay in order to uh, talk about the jordan canonical form i need to uh, introduce a couple of definitions so So the first is uh, a nilpotent matrix. So A in C to the n cross n is said to be nilpotent if A power k equals what? Zero. Zero. So the smallest positive k for which this happens um, is called the index of the nilpotent matrix. Of course, if a power k equals zero, then a power k plus one, a power k plus two, all that is always equal to zero. So for example, if a is the matrix zero, one, zero, zero, then um, a squared is the all zero matrix. And so we say that it is nilpotent of index 2. More generally, if um, A is the n cross n matrix, with ones on the super diagonal, and zeros elsewhere, then a power n equals zero, meaning that the matrix is nilpotent of index n. So basically the Jordan canonical form theorem later will say that every matrix is similar to a matrix of form D plus N, where D is a diagonal matrix and N is a nilpotent matrix. So that's what we are going to go towards. So, so um, yeah. So what is super diagonal? Super diagonal are the entries just above the diagonal. Okay, sir. The diagonal, not the diagonal. So this is the diagonal. And this is the super diagonal. And similarly, this thing would be the subdiagonal. Okay, so if you have ones on the super diagonal, if you square this matrix, what you'll find is that you can hand compute it, it's easy. You, you, the ones will come in the second super diagonal. Then if you take the, this matrix power three or you multiply that by this matrix again, it will come in the um, third super diagonal and then fourth, fifth, sixth. Eventually, it will come to be a matrix with all zeros except this entry being equal to one. And then you multiply that one more time by this matrix, it'll get rid of everything and you'll get zero matrix. <coughs> so, uh, K cross K Jordan block J of lambda with uh, lambda being a complex number is this is the following matrix it has lambdas on the diagonal and ones on the first super diagonal and then zeros everywhere else and is of size k cross k so lambda is on the diagonal one is on the super diagonal and zero everywhere else. 
So this matrix is called a, a K cross K Jordan block with lambda. And of course, when K equals one, J of lambda is just equal to lambda. So we'll also sometimes use J K of lambda uh, when we want to indicate the, the size of the matrix. OK, so this is for the K cross K. So we will use both these notations. Uh, hopefully I won't be too confusing to you, but uh, here I'm not using the subscript key. So this J1 of lambda or J of lambda is just lambda for a one cross one matrix. Or a scalar. And uh, also J of lambda. In the K cross K uh, case is Lambda times the K cross K identity matrix. So I'll write it this way so that it's clear. JK of lambda is lambda times the K cross K identity matrix plus N, where N is a nilpotent matrix. Of uh, index K with ones on the super diagonal. So it's the all zero matrix with ones on the super diagonal. OK, so we have the following uh, theorem. Uh, which I think since we have only one minute left, um, I'll just leave it for the next time. So maybe pique your interest a little and say that Jordan form theorem. What it will say is that A in C to the N cross N is similar to a matrix of the form J1 of lambda 1, JK of or JR of lambda R, where these are Jordan, uh, Jordan matrices or Jordan blocks. So again, I think I'm messing up notation a bit, but uh, is a Jordan block. of size, not i cross i, n i cross n i. These are, so there's a bad notation here. I'll fix that the next time. So, um, uh, so this is of, this is corresponding to <laughs> eigenvalue lambda i of, okay. So this is what we will state and prove in the next class. We'll stop here for today.